Hey everyone, this is Betty. Uh, we are back for another episode of the Multi-Cloud Maturity Model Discussion Series. And today I'm really excited to have Mandy Storbakken, Solution Engineering Manager in our very own Multi-Cloud Management Emerging Business Group to have a discussion around DevOps and its role in multi-cloud maturity. Hey Mandy, thanks for joining. Thanks for having me. Um, so, you know, you've been on both sides. You've been on the vendor side as well as the end user organization side in kind of in architecting cloud solutions. Um, and you're, you know, you spend a lot of time in cloud management and operations, and you've written a ton about DevOps. And can you, to kick us off, start, tell us a little bit about the connection between these three things, cloud, cloud management, and DevOps? Yeah, so I think they're all intrinsically connected. So I have had a lot of background in cloud management and building cloud solutions. Then when I came into VMware, it was as a cloud management um, SE selling solutions. Then I moved into the business unit working, you know, building um, and uh, marketing cloud management solutions. So that's where my familiar familiarity is. Um, and But DevOps is very, very much uh, interconnected to all of those things. So the way I look at it is that uh, cloud is the delivery of IT services and uh, resources. And then cloud management is getting um, uh, some kind of consistent management across disparate cloud environments of workloads and or delivering capabilities that allow you to um, evolve your virtual environments to a cloud, so self-service, on-demand resources, um, those kinds of capabilities. And then DevOps is very dependent on those capabilities to be able to, um, to do some of the best practices like delivery pipelines, infrastructure as code, some of the technology that the DevOps culture depends on um, to, uh, to, to, to do software delivery. So in, in, if I can summarize what you just said, it's um, one is the delivery of cloud services. And there's kind of then the bit of like operationalizing those services in an organization, and then the practices and processes around that whole kind of ecosystem. Yes. Yeah. And actually, there's sometimes a debate. I believe that DevOps is, is kind of central to cloud and your cloud operating model. And then there are many that disagree with me and think that it's something separate. I don't think it really matters. It's all about what an organization is using to solve their business problems. The DevOps practices are becoming much more widely used within organizations and they, you know, unquestionably depend on, on cloud technologies. Yeah, and it's um, uh, I hear you on that debate, um, and it's a good segue into you know understanding like you know DevOps is you know it's a practice and a set of process um, process, um, and it's simultaneously a separation of concerns and a way of bringing those kind of practices and disciplines together to work more harmoniously. Can you talk about how they're coming together? Yeah, so I mean DevOps just even from the name itself is kind of this concept of instead of the traditional way of having. Uh, development teams and functions um, in uh, in one side of an organization and then a handover of, um, you know, the completed application and the operational um, functions and uh, and operations on another a part of the organization. DevOps is bringing them together, whether it's bringing collaboration between the teams together, whether it's bringing the functionality together in a smoother, you know, um, loop like the DevOps loop, um, or whether it's bringing the it together entirely in one resource, um, you know, as we look towards uh, SREs and those kinds of resources. If you look at the traditional development side of the DevOps loop, the plan, code, build, test, and release part of the application lifecycle, traditionally that's been completely separate um, from separate teams, separate functions, separate processes. And then the application is handed over to, in the traditional model, the operation side of what's now the DevOps loop for the deployment, operation, and monitoring of those um, applications. Again, separate teams, separate, uh, separate um, tools, uh, separate processes. And so DevOps tries to bring these together, not just co with collaboration between the teams, but also um, between the tools and integrating the functions that, uh, that are part of each of these phases. The trouble is that the um, priorities and personas of these different um, of these different sides of the DevOps loop are very separate and different. So from the DevOps from the Dev side, you're looking at agility, um, a fast rate of change in terms of building features and deploying them and releasing them as part of the application. And the more traditional operations side has been more around stability, 
minimizing change as much as possible um, and uh, and really resiliency and those kinds of things. So instead of looking at those as two separate teams or, um, or, or f- processes or functions now, we kind of look at them as one, but on a spectrum of um, priorities around the persona. So we look at it as a DevOps persona, but you may be more towards the provider side of the persona, which is the more traditional platform teams or um, IT teams delivering services, uh, or more the consumer side where you are more closer to you know, a traditional developer and then just consuming um, services. So it's more a continuum now and it will continue to come together more and more um, as you the teams are starting to now find that they have more aligned objectives, which comes from organizational um, change and, um, and a better understanding of the, the perspectives of, of the different sides of that continuum. Yeah, because it's actually um, is looking at everything. It's it's looking at more from the life cycle of the service or the app that needs to be delivered and all the people that need to be involved all of the functions and then the priorities at each stage. And, you know, this is why in many ways, like DevOps is such a huge culture change because now it's this continuous loop. Everybody's interconnected um, and there is no more of this like flip it over the fence and I'm done with my thing. It doesn't matter anymore. And while this is such a big fundamental um, culture and process change, which can be hard for many organizations, um, some of it can be facilitated by technology, right? By the tool chains that are used um, in this. Um, Can you talk a little bit about how some of the tools can facilitate this and how people should think about that? Yeah, so there's often, I think it can be intimidating to to people that have worked in more traditional organizations or operations to look at DevOps and think, oh, now I'm going to need to become a developer or a developer to think now I'm going to have to become an infrastructure expert. Um, And that's not necessarily the case. There certainly are organizations that will try and bring those roles together and that you be as cross-functional as possible. But for the most part, it's just bringing the roles um, together and technology certainly facilitates that. And so the more that we can um, automate things and build resilient automation into our processes, um, the the easier it is to to start to integrate. So then you see things like um, infrastructure as code, for example, where we are now able to, through defining our infrastructure as code, uh, infrastructure components in a text format and having the system do the interpretation and the delivery of that, Um, of that infrastructure component, we're now able to apply some best practices coming out of the development world to infrastructure. And the same with some pipeline capabilities and other kinds of um, uh, capabilities that um, are becoming more and more available to um, your your, your traditional um, operations resources. So it's all dependent on on technology, really. In fact, if you look at DevOps, if you do a Google search for DevOps, kind of the um, the utopia is this continuous integration, continuous delivery. You know, and organizations look at Netflix and go, look, I work for a bank. We're never going to be doing 200 deployments in an hour. It's not just going to happen. Um, but um, it's not, not all organizations need or want to get to that level. But there are certainly vast improvements they can make to their software um, development and management functions within their own, own organizations through technology. And you bring up a good point, which I think is, um, um, you know, DevOps, you, the big examples are those web scale companies. And so people are like, how do I get from here to there? And it's, it can't seem scary. And then, you know, is it just a, um, you know, looking at a bunch of tools and just buy everything? And is that going to solve my problem? An important thing might be is like, can the adoption of DevOps be iterative and be, you know, and can re- value be realized along that path? I absolutely 100% think so. In fact, in fact, I'm a strong believer in iterating everything, um, small iterative. Continuous. <laughs> continually iterate, continuous improvement. Um, and that's central to the, again, to the DevOps uh, movement and culture. And many times they are talking about, continue, you know, if you hear it in that context, it is talking about continuous integration of, of code and, and testing and gating and those kinds of things and continuous delivery or deployment. Again, this kind of utopia. But to me, it, culturally, it goes much further than that. It is about continuous improvement of, of working in IT in general, of technology, of learning um, so that you can, uh, you know, build your um, career. Uh, I think that uh, this new way of iteratively learning, try something, 
get feedback, you know, change course is extremely effective and efficient. Yeah. And I guess um, this really applies to when you talked about the two different, you know, the two different sides of the house, they have very almost competing priorities. And instead of trying to change everything at once, if the infrastructure team is able to automate one or two things at a time till they get um, to find the things that are super stable to automate, it can open up the aperture a little bit more to, for the development teams. Each For each thing that's automated, they can possibly ship with something, change something a little bit faster. Right. Well, if you look at the early DevOps movement, many of the early adopters, those organizations that were involved in, in the development of some of the, the key principles and, and um, ideas, and some of those earlier adopters, usually it came as a result of a big bad event. It, you know, I know that there was one retail organization who was very prominent in the early days, and they had had this huge waterfall software project that was delivering an, app, delivering an application for customers. And, uh, you know, it, I think it was an 18 month project. By the time they delivered the application, it was obsolete and it, it you know, did not deliver the, the, the capabilities that were needed by the customer, nor um, whether the same capabilities needed today that they had started building for 18 months ago. So that's really, you know, what's driven the DevOps movement and it's applicable to every business. Um, today because things in technology are moving so fast. Yeah, and you know, if we look back to just even in the last year and a half, no one would have expected what to have happened um, to be able to pivot on a dime that we all needed to kind of in the beginning of 2020, but it's kind of forced the hand on, you know, people looking at these, like how do we become more agile? How do we, you know, take advantage of these things? How do we automate so that we can, you know, make the adjustments that we need to, right? Yes, absolutely. And those those organizations that were not able to adjust quickly fed very poorly through the pandemic, very poorly. You know, with the growing adoption of cloud and that, you know, often becoming kind of a, uh, you know, an opportunity to change some of these practices, um, we're also seeing, you know, there's DevOps teams, but then the rise of different organizational structures, um, DevOps being one of them, um, specifically, you know, around cloud center of excellence, platform engineering teams, and how do these all relate to each other? Are they replacements for one another? Are they evolutions or are they all kind of um, additive? to the existing organizations? I think, again, this is where we're seeing organizations iterate on uh, what they've been doing, and it's usually more of an evolution. I, you know, For a long time before uh, DevOps even became um, a, you know, this, this word, uh, we had this concept of service delivery. And, um, and cloud delivery isn't all, all that far away. And so we t started to talk about building teams around the services. And so if you look at cloud, for example, if you look at your um, catalog, either in your private cloud or your public cloud, service delivery would be around, you know, your teams are centered around the service that you're delivering. So kind of those catalog items. Um, and then we have organizations that are building, uh, you know, the platform teams, each, each um, of those teams supporting a different platform stack for their application developers, which I'm not entirely convinced that that's, you know, that that's a thing yet um, because, because the DevOps movement is all about empowering uh, users um, and developers uh, to be able to choose the best tool for the job that they need to get done. And so, you know, you, you can have any number of combinations. And then there's a cloud center of excellence, which I think is something that's fairly consistent. Um, I've seen it in many organizations and it, they're really kind of, I, I see them as being the gatekeepers of kind of the cloud strategy um, and translating that into your cloud operating model and making sure that the correct guardrails are in place. It's really a governance function around, you know, um, financial governance and operations and security and compliance, really protecting the organization. So I don't think that um, that there's a right way to do things, despite what some of the analyst organizations will tell you. I think companies are very much trying um, trying some different things, and and it remains to be seen what's going to be the prevalent model. Yeah, and like you said before, it kind of depends on where they are in their own evolution, um, and then also their appetite for um, how much they how how much and how frequently they want to be changing because. Um, depending on the industry or the customers that they're serving, um, their rate of change may need to be different, right? Or not. And, um, and how seriously they take it. I know one organization that just renamed all its project managers to um, Scrum Masters and then wondered why, you know, they weren't um, doing a fantastic job with Agile. So it's, a, it's not a small undertaking. It's a huge undertaking. 
And so I think we're far from having defined the, the perfect model and it will keep evolving. Yeah, I mean, there's like general constructs, but then um, it'll be, it's still evolving. And then how that gets adopted will vary from org to org. Yeah, right? yeah. yeah. Um, and you made a good uh, comment about governance and when a future episode, we're gonna have a whole discussion just around what does governance mean in multi-cloud, in a multi-cloud world, because it's it's so different when you're kind of consuming, literally consuming all of the things all the time. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, what we find is that every organization, for the most part, is multi-cloud. They didn't always intend to be. It may not be a core part of their core strategy, but there's very tactical use of cloud, whether it's through a business unit has decided that there's functionality that they need um, or an acquisition that you've brought in an organization that has a footprint in a different cloud. It's there. But where it's a tactical use of cloud, it's different teams, different processes, different governance models. And what we're finding are organizations are realizing that we have to get some consistency across these disparate environments or we simply can't manage them. Yeah. Yeah. And then with that, you know, the, the enabling of the teams to kind of do the um, user right tool for the job. How, what is the implication of that in shifting left and DevOps? This, you know, there's... Yeah, so shifting left is um, is uh, another um, concept that we've seen come through kind of this bringing op op best practices from the software development world into infrastructure and operations. And so as we start to automate more and more in uh, within infrastructure and infrastructure as code and start using um, pipelines for uh, testing and delivery of infrastructure components, um, and those kinds of things, we can start to move some of those functions because they're automated and we can, through a cloud service delivery model, give access to those functions as needed to earlier in the, in, in the software delivery lifecycle, we see that shifting left. So it originally was around doing integrate, you know, I think the concept was mostly um, associated with doing integration testing far earlier in the software development lifecycle where you could catch problems earlier and deal with them more cheaply and those kinds of things rather than at the last minute. But as it's evolved, now that we're making these capabilities around maybe a security scan or having um, a an application deployed to production hardware that maybe doesn't look you know the same as um, the development hardware, if you move those things earlier in that software development lifecycle and into that earlier testing, same applies, catch those problems earlier um, and be able to deal with them earlier. So I think the big misnomer around shift left that I hear from uh, concerned customers is that I don't want to move my security into the um, hands of the developers or some of these other functions. And it's not about that. We're not moving the subject matter expertise necessarily. We're um, making those capabilities available in a curated manner so that we can um, have them considered much earlier in that development process so that we can make sure that we deal with those issues as, as they come up. Yeah, and I want to say you have a really great um, article that you recently wrote about what does shift left mean for IT teams because it can sound, you know, as with DevOps, sometimes it can sound like I'm an ops, I'm uh, this is taking things away from me in many ways. But in fact, in some ways, it's back to that continuum. And some things like they shouldn't all just be, you shouldn't all just wait to that to the end. Let's um, get some things well known and let's start to kind of spread that out across the life cycle. So in some ways, it's a shared burden and it's a shared operation, over, overall life cycle and operations. And then uh, with the desired goal to make everything a little more efficient and faster at the end, right? Yeah, in fact, traditional operations teams should embrace this because if nothing else, it gives visibility to their essential components throughout the life cycle. Um, bolt on security and, and, and bolt on after the fact, after the application has been deployed, anything not only is not effective and doesn't work particularly well, but it's hidden. It, and, and so this is a good way for the you know, operations teams to be, to be more visible. Yeah, I mean, this um, uh, to that end, you hear a little bit of the DevSecOps now, and they're mm -hmm. saying it actually, it's just part of DevOps. It's part right. of the life cycle. It's part of the supply chain. Um, it's all about, so the, all of this is about shipping great software faster, right? Yeah. Um, I mean, we love to come up with these new, you know, names yeah. for things and, you know, shove some new words together and they're pithy and they're fun. But at the end of the day, it's all iterating. The more capabilities we bring through technology to abstract 
this complex this underlying complexity the more we can we can do with it and i think that's what we're seeing we're seeing iteratively we're realizing that hey you know being able to abstract and and um i i heard security as code yesterday i've heard policy as code for for years now um all of these things it's i think it's a natural evolution of um of what we're doing that's um and with that i think that's a great way to close this uh fantastic discussion and we'll also include links to um, some of those great articles you wrote to give um, give insight to traditional it folks on devops shifting left and all this goodness and join me next time for the next discussion on multi-cloud maturity thanks mandy thanks so much betsy